viewers on the internet, <laughs> we uh, recommence our uh, session and um, I'm sorry that I uh, choose these uh, hands-on uh, exercises that require the internet. Um, it will get better. I think the next uh, exercise is without internet and then tomorrow we do the statistical analysis that, um, not, that, that uh, you don't need the internet as well. It's just because I thought when you do it by your own you need to know where to access all the data and so on. So I would suggest that you like today in the afternoon or whatever on your own internet you try everything again and then tomorrow we can talk about what what went wrong what is still unclear and what what possible uh, things could we do more um, I want to start the third session on the presentation of spatial data and relationships and um, I'll show you first, so now we're doing some theoretical stuff again and then I'll show you some start in QGIS and as before you should probably uh, just do it yourself and then you can discuss uh, where problems are still. Okay, first some types of presentations, then I want to highlight some principles of cartographic presentations or what are good maps and what are bad maps, what are probably things that you should think about and then I'll show you how to do it in QGIS. So this is a map of Germany and German universities. These are the excellent universities in Germany, Konstanz you see uh, on the bottom, yeah, very excellent university. Uh, but there are some, some more and um, this is just, so this is a map to present spatial data, but it's univariate spatial data and there is not much information. It, you can say, okay, in southern Germany there are more universities than in northern Germany, but much more you can't say. So it's, it's just for illustrative purposes. Um, more interesting, like for uh, social scientists and scientists, um, in general is when you map, when you create a map to present spatial relationships, that is you have bivariate spatial data and that is you have not one kind of units like we had before universities but you have two kind of information. So for example UFOs yeah, in the US, UFO sightings spatially uh, the, these are, I don't know, some kind of regional units and uh, for each unit there is a number of UFO sightings in one year. So the more purple, the more sightings. So um, what would you conclude? That there are, there are regions in the US where there are UFO sightings and there are regions where there are no UFO sightings. Alright, so this is still univariate. Yeah, you see, okay, uh, in, the, in the west there are more sightings than in the middle, basically, yeah, of the US. Okay, so now second characteristic or second, uh, second information, Area 51. Yeah? Where is Area 51? Mm -hmm. Area 51 is around uh, this region. And as you would uh, imagine uh, from a, re, uh, a base where uh, where aliens live, basically what we know from Hollywood movies, there are more uh, sightings of unidentified flight objects than in other parts of uh, of the United States. So we could conclude from this simple bivariate um, map that there is like there's more sightings of unidentified uh, flight objects in areas close to area 51 and as we know in area 51 there are aliens. So, okay, this is, uh, as you might guess, uh, just for uh, just a fun example for illustrative purposes. But it shows you uh, 
that is more interesting to have like two kind of objects or characteristics that are in some kind of relationship uh, to each other. Um, the other example for this kind of maps I showed you already is the, the famous ghost map of John Snow, uh, where we have cholera deaths and water pumps, and we infer some kind of rela relationship uh, from each other. So we have now two different kinds of <coughs> presentation. One is univariate spatial data, one is bivariate spatial data to map special relationships. Then you could uh, use maps for the presentation of the results of statistical models. Um, and you can use maps. I think this is a very good application um, to use maps for field work of surveys. So when to coordinate surveys, I will show you an example. Um, okay, this is for example, we had uh, an, a, sur a survey in Switzerland. This is uh, all the respondents in Switzerland. And now, of course, you could map and you encode in the color of these dots some results of some statistical model. This is the independent variable. This is a le political left-right scheme. You can't say, you can't see too much because it's different shades of grey and um, there are a lot of dots but still for illustrative purposes just to communicate that you have this kind of data structure it's probably very powerful and um, sometimes one can even see patterns <coughs> but of course these patterns when you have like 500 dots you have to somehow statistically assess but like um, as an additional graphical presentation, this is probably interesting. Okay, uh, another thing that we did is, um, we, uh, this was a study about uh, migrants in uh, Baden-Württemberg, which is the federal state um, where Constance is. And we wanted to have a good representation of all the areas in this uh, federal state. And so we did a map and uh, we know that there, there are some regions where we have no respondents but in most regions we have at least one respondent and that is kind of a good sign for a representative uh, survey. So I think this is always uh, good um, for the assessment of representativeness of the survey when you just map it and you see you have uh, respondents in the, in the whole area that you are investigating. So the, the most important of these presentations is the so-called chloroplath map. And this is simply a thematic map with colors representing characteristics of the spatial units. And these colors can represent any statistical measure and it can be continuous or categorically. Categorical. Usually it just means it's, it's means of continuous characteristics. So, for example, here we have the share of Germans in these different neighborhoods in, uh, in Kreuzlingen. Yeah? And the lower the share, the redder is the color. So you encode some kind of continuous um, characteristic in these colors. And this is kind of a map that you see a, a lot oftentimes and people know how to read it and uh, you can communicate very forcefully. Um, but, but you always have to think about area and I will show you how we can do this. It's really easy. Um, you have to be aware that you think about the area size, the choice of color and the choice of categories. Uh, there's a a nice, I, I tell you why, um, there's a nice um, paper by Gelman and Price that states all maps of parameter estimates are misleading. Uh, um, why are they misleading? Because larger units have a more visual impact. 
and smaller units. And that this does not have to correspond with, for example, how many people live there. So when you see here the, in the US, there are, like in the Midwest, there are huge districts, huge area units, but almost no one is living there. Yeah? And on the East Coast, there is a lot of people living on the East Coast in the, in the US, and um, these districts are very small, so they have a very small visual impact. Yeah? And so you see some outliers, but that does not mean that these are real, really regions where they are, I think here's cancer <coughs> rates or something. So it, it does not have to mean anything. And the, the problem is with these parameter estimates, you have only the point estimate, but you have no kind of way of visualize the margin of error in this kind of maps. So you have to be a bit cautious and for example in yeah, yeah, here it is as well, we have larger units and smaller units and these larger units can be just um, the harbor and no one is living there but because it's such a large unit it, there is a lot of uh, influence visually. Yeah. Um, the other thing is the choice of color, yeah, when you, you have to be a bit careful that you don't infer from uh, your colors some meaning that's probably <coughs> too much. So, for example, you should not map uh, the share of migrants in red because red somehow symbolizes danger or something like that. So, uh, that would be something that we should avoid, I think. So, sometimes you have to be a bit careful. And then something, but I will come to this uh, later, uh, how you choose the different categories is not as easy as, as one thinks at the first moment. I mean, that's a problem in every time when we categorize a continuous variable, how do we, do we make quantiles or do we do it like evenly uh, across the spectrum and then we have empty categories and what do we do with it and so on. So it's not, not that easy and you have to at least put a little bit of thought in it. Um, okay, uh, now something with regard to cartography or what I think is important when you are building maps or when you are mapping something. Um, Maybe you can read it by your own. Uh, it's a nice little story. That's a, that's a whole story of uh, Jorge Luis Borges. Um, and it's about exactitude in science. So uh, yeah, you can read it yourself. I can tell you it's a story, um, a fictitious history about uh, <coughs> an empire and this um, emperor. He he wanted to have a map that was so detailed that it had to be as large as the empire itself. And um, I think this is a this is a good symbol for what we should strive for in the social sciences, or when we do maps, or, or even when we do statistical models. It should it should not be like exactly like in reality, we have always to have some degree of abstraction from, from reality, just to grasp, grasp the main and the most important characteristics. Um, and that's the same with the, with the map, I think. You have to, it has to be detailed enough that you see everything that you want to communicate, but you have to leave out all the unnecessary stuff. Yeah, every map is an abstraction of the reality and you have to find the right the right dimension. Um, this is, I think, the one uh, principle and the other principles I derive, or not I, but I took it uh, from our website, named Radical Cartography. Uh, um, and it's an application of the principles of uh, Edward Tufte. I don't know whether you heard from him. He did a lot of work on graphical presentation 
not only in the social science but in sciences as well. And um, he has some really beautiful books about presentation of data. You, you should all um, have a look at them. Um, and the first, uh, the, the most important thing that he always says is that when we do some um, presentation of data, when we do some graphs, uh, we should maximize the data in ratio. So we should um, put more focus on data and information with less ink. Huh? That is, we should reframe, like, and he says, good, good graphical presentation has a very high data ink ratio. So this is very abstract, but uh, for example, this means we should uh, we should abstain from from any 3D effects or, uh, for example, a pie chart has a very low data ink ratio because sometimes you encode in a pie chart only like four numbers that add to 100, but it takes a lot of space, the pie chart. And additionally, the human eye is not very good with angles, so we cannot really distinguish between 24% and 27% or something like that in a pie chart. Um, so this is all derived from these principles from Tafti. And um, so first principle, map substantial information. So this is an ocean chart. Yeah, you see <coughs> nothing because it's just ocean. Yeah? So uh, we should not uh, create maps just to create maps, but we should always include some kind of information and the more multivariate the information is, the better it is usually, so that you can really um, have a high data ink ratio, so to say. So, um, commandment one, map substantial information. Commandment two, don't lie with maps. As with statistics, you can also lie with maps. Yeah, maps are always made with a purpose and purpose will drive the choice of the classification scheme, for example, I come to this later. Um, and each scheme has advantages and disadvantages, um, and each obscures and emphasizes different aspects of the data. So this is something we should at least be aware of. Uh, then we should label the maps in a way that they are, they can be understand, understood just from looking of the map and not reading a lot of text uh, outside of the map. And that can mean that you include explanatory text on the maps. You can just write, put a text field on the map and so on. So it's not, it's not that we, we, we don't draw these maps that people can, can orient themselves in Kiev and know where they have to go right and left, but we are doing like maps to communicate some kind of research. And so we don't have to um, do it all correctly like what cartographers do, but we have, we have more degrees of freedom. Um, we should minim minimize map crap. That's what they say, so 3D effects, borders, uh, big north arrows, that's something we usually don't need. So when we have a map of the Ukraine, um, then usually the readers know where north is and where south is and west and east. And sometimes it can even be handy to rotate the map as, as you wish. It's because we are cartographers, we have more degrees of freedom and we should maximize information ratio. Okay, map layout matters, yeah, um, that's also important, like uh, how you arrange everything and uh, whether you do it with the north to the top or to the bottom. And then 
last commandment, evaluate your map. Sometimes this is a commandment which is probably true for all kinds of research. Sometimes in our head um, things look very nice and uh, everything is very clear, but um, we should probably uh, test it on reality and on peers and then when they have a lot of question marks in their eyes, we see, we, we can see, okay, we have to get back and uh, think more about our maps and our, our research and so on. So this is more a general point, of course, uh, but I think always worth mentioning. Yeah. All right, now I get more specific. Um, firstly, when creating a thematic map, like this chloroplast map, Categories are key. They are very important. Uh, and so this is a survey we did in Constance. These are different neighborhoods and these uh, different colors correspond to different means uh, for, for, for some kind of uh, answer. And I think it's um, whether people are satisfied with their lives or not. Huh? And Blue is they are not so much satisfied and the green uh, colors is they are very satisfied. So, and now you would conclude, okay, um, uh, here uh, in the blue areas people are not satisfied with their life and uh, green uh, here on the, on the lake front, they are very satisfied with their lives. Okay, this is one interpretation. But when you look on the scale, then you see Basically, in Constance, every, everyone is satisfied. So, uh, when you would have a different scheme, how to categorize the data, you would have everything in green. So, you have to decide whether uh, you want to show like the absolute level of satisfaction. Yeah? Then you have to have different categories. And then you would say, oh, it's, everything is green, it's very, very good in Constance, everyone is happy. Yeah? But for the city of Constance, with whom we did the study, it was more important to say, okay, relatively to the people in Constance, who, where are the regions where people are especially happy and people not quite as happy. So we had a different categorization. So now we have blue areas, which we wouldn't have had if we had, another, if we had for example, um, equally spaced categories. Huh? But this is the relative happiness. And so you have to decide what you want to communicate. And that's, that's sometimes uh, a huge um, issue. And also, um, is comparability important? So you can categorize on the one map like this, and then you have nice colors. But do you want to have this? Uh, this kind of categorization also for different maps and when you, when you have like different maps one color should always correspond to the same to the same kind of values and that's something sometimes not so easy when you do the, the, like automatically and when you do quintiles then sometimes one color corresponds to one value and sometimes to another value and that's really <coughs> very confusing when you read the maps but you should be at least um, aware of it. Um, okay, a second uh, important point that I um, had, had before but will make now again um, is that colors are important. Um, one is that the meaning of colors is important, but the other thing is that you should anticipate the use of the map. So if you have a nice colorful map, <coughs> and uh, but people will print it out and have it only in black and white or in gray tones then it could be that your nice colors are just lost and um, so you have to anticipate a bit the use of, of your maps uh, some journals are only in black and white some journals are in color sometimes you have to pay the journals if you have colorful pictures so it, it's better to to have black and white uh, pictures and so on. Um, and a good website that we 
won't open now because then the internet breaks down again, <laughs> but which you can uh, open at home or later is this website colorbrewer2.org and there they have examples of different color schemes and they and you can choose whether it should be uh, the color should be also distinguishable in black and white whether it should is okay for colorblind people um, what color scheme you could use when you have four categories what color scheme you could use when you have five categories when you have continuous um, data when you have the, the colors should be very diverging um, and they give you uh, the, the color values and you can insert it in your, uh, in your geographic information system so this is always a good website when you are thinking about color schemes and how you can best do it so but that makes it all uh, already very uh, very complicated um, and that's why it's better to just try with the data that we have um, how we could um, uh, how we could present some uh, we could present it in a map and that's something that I will show you now again and it should work with the data that I gave you on the USB stick so it should work without internet okay um, now maybe I, sh I show it to you like with the, uh, with the QGIS and then I give you this slide again and then you can make it by your own. So um, I think we open a new no window, we have your neighborhoods yeah, and this should be our, um, our map and, um, but I want to have not the whole constants, there are these villages over there, so I probably am not so interested in it and I will zoom, zoom uh, that I have only like the core of constants here in my picture. So this is the first step, I uh, want to map only this part of, of the whole thing that I have there. Alright, and then the second thing is I want to I compose a map, this is done with the print composer. Yeah, and when you click there, I don't need a name, I have a new window and the, it's very easy. There's this uh, button here, add new map. I, I have it on the slide so you, you will see. So you add the map and then you just, um, this is like a, a piece of paper. That's when you export it, then you see exactly this. And then you can just uh, like drag a box and you with the left mouse button pushed and when you release it then you have like this map as you wish and you can uh, okay you have to like for the for, for the for the script you have what kind of data you want to show that you have to uh, um, just here in this window but this is then the map and then you can adjust it or you will push it around and you can even edit with layout some kind of scale or um, and, uh, yeah, some kind of scale or a legend or something else and then you have this and then you can adjust it and there you have a lot of uh, different options um, where you can adjust how this is uh, displayed, but you see here this is four, four kilometers, so this is uh, automatically adjusted everything. And then you can, can arrange this as you like and, and either you save it or you export it as an image, as a PDF, or you print it directly um, and can do everything you like with it afterwards. So, this is a very simple and quick way of, um, uh, of generating maps out of the data that you have in your geographic information system. So now everything is green here and um, this is okay in a way, but um, it 
does not transport a lot of information, it just shows me the neighborhoods um, of constants. So it gets interesting when we add like different <coughs> colors to different uh, values of interest. So um, that something we do in the properties uh, box and we have here we can uh, it's even pre-selected the style yeah? and style here is this uh, very beautiful green but for for all the neighborhoods yeah? it's a single symbol for all the neighborhoods but we want different uh, symbols yeah? we can have categorized symbols that is we have maybe categories, we have neighborhoods in Constance and neighborhoods in Kreuzlingen and they should have different colors, for example. But I want to show you the graduated um, symbol style. Yeah? And for the graduated symbol style, you need to um, select one characteristic of the neighborhoods. This is, uh, we can do like the number of inhabitants. Huh? And the number of inhabitants should be encoded in different colors uh, in this map and it should have like here I can change but maybe different shades of blue, yeah? lighter blue, less inhabitants, darker blue, more inhabitants. Huh? I select this, very good. <coughs> And then I want to have like five different classes, you see over there, and they should categorize in equal intervals. You see there are different other uh, schemes and we should think about uh, how to best communicate, but it's like, this is for just the beginning. And then we click of classify and it gives you five classes automatically and uh, these uh, correspond to different uh, colors. And when I apply this over here, then I see that I have here different shades of blue for different values of my characteristic, which is inhabitants. So very easy. And then, of course, I can adjust a lot of things. For example, I can uh, manually write here in the legend, because I don't want to have like all the decimals. I can want to have, okay, this is 149 to 960, and so this does not change the underlying categorization, but it just uh, changes the, the display in the legend. Um, or I could just write something, I could, uh, I could just write low or something else so you, this is something you can adjust you can you can also play around with the borders of the categories when you have here the histogram and you see nothing but um, but you can also adjust all the borders you can do a lot of things with this classification another thing that is interesting for um, mapping purposes is that you have can add some transparency to this to this layer that you have. So, for example, when you have a, a base map from Microsoft or Google, and you add transparency, then you have the colors, but you also see um, a bit of the map below. So, I want to I want to show you, and I hope I don't crash the internet. <coughs> Yeah. Okay, so now we have a base map and we have the neighborhoods and the neighborhoods have different colors. So now when you use this map to communicate with the inhabitants of Constance, they might be a bit confused because they don't really know where these neighborhoods are. I mean they can infer probably from the coastline and from the river, but 
Yeah, like where exactly the borders are, they don't know. So therefore, we can we can add some transparency, ninety percent uh, more. And then you have the color, but you still can see what's below. What are the the different roads or different other features? So people could can orient themselves more on the map. These are really nice features when you have like color and it's colorful and you have high resolution. But as as soon as you print it on on a copy machine, you won't see anything anymore. So you have to anticipate this. A bit. So, but. When we go back now to our to our composer, and probably we have to <coughs> we have to have a new map. Yeah. All right. So now I wanted to show you, and now it's not working. Ah, ah, here. You see. Almost, it looks almost nice. So it should be it you now everything colorful and so on. But now you have we have a, a a very nice map without a lot of effort. Uh, yeah, you see, it has to reload the, the the base map, but in general, it should. So if you if you export it, it should be fine. Uh, I promise. <laughs> Okay, so this is what you can do with uh, how you can do like this chloroplast ma maps and um, I would suggest that you try it out by yourself um, with the neighborhood shape file that I gave you in the data folder. And um, yeah, one, more, one more thing, so this was like from the, this was what I wanted to do with you up up till now so maybe after after you could uh, tell me what we should like do more in detail to tomorrow or the day after or on monday so what what kind of things you see that a lot of different uh, construction sites i would say like how you uh, generate data, how you map data, and so on. I can only sketch how it's done, but um, of course we can have more exercise or you just try it out and ask you if it's not working. So this is, this is one thing um, that you, you can maybe um, tell me afterwards. And the, the second thing I have for the spatial uh, statistical analysis, um, I need some feedback whether you would like to do it in R or in Stata. So I, I tell you up front, I'm, uh, I'm personally working with Stata um, and I think for, um, like for a course like this, it's, it's easier to communicate because the code is slimmer and, and easier. Yeah? But of course, you can do a lot more with R. So um, I don't know what kind of program you are usually using, and I would adjust the, the examples as you like. So are you usually using R? Who is very much R? I use SPSS. You use SPSS? Everybody. Everybody is using SPSS. Okay, so it's probably. <coughs> easier than when we do it with Stata. So with SPSS you can't do anything. But with Stata, um, I could show you like the, the, the basic steps and so that you get an understanding what we are doing here. Yeah? And then we can, then we can maybe do a, do a bit more. Um, there's a, I brought a book, um, Applied Spatial Data Analysis with R. Maybe we, I can't uh, leave it here because it belongs to the uh, library of the university, but maybe we can copy it or photograph it or I don't know, or maybe you just have a look at it.
Okay, so um, we'll, see to, we'll, we'll see tomorrow how the, the statistical analysis works. But it's not so easy. It's like what we did up to this point. It's, there's no rocket science involved. It's just, I mean, the basic idea, how the data is analyzed, and then you can do a lot of things and you have to explore it a bit on your own. All right, now we have 15 minutes left and my proposal would be that you just try to replicate what I did and when you don't know how to go on, then you just call me and I come to your place and we try to do it together. Yeah.